to go. All right, welcome everyone. I'm Tina Panic from the Avon Library. Welcome to our third lecture in our Paleo Indian series. Um, for today's event, your video and audio will be automatically turned off. We will be recording this and then sharing it to everyone who registered as well as posting it on our YouTube channel. Please use the Q&A box to share any questions, comments, concerns. Um, we will look at it throughout the program, but we'll do all the questions at the end. Um, and you will receive a survey as well. And we will give you the link to register for the next one in the series. Everything is in a great format so you can just participate as easily as possible. Um, our partners for this are the Avon Senior Center as well as the Avon Historical Society. And I'm gonna turn it over to Terry Wilson from the Historical Society so she can introduce Ken. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Avon Historical Society, the Avon Library, the Avon Senior Center, our town historian and the planning committee for unearthing history, I welcome you to the third educational and informative event in this series. We're thanking the Farmington Bank Community Foundation for a grant to make all this possible. For those of you joining us for the first time tonight, welcome. For our regulars, welcome back. And as some of you may know, the discovery of the Brian Jones Paleo Indian site along the Farmington River in Avon happened in 2019. In February of 2020, we held the first public presentation about it at the Avon Senior Center. This series is designed to break down information for the general public about this 12,500 year old human occupation site for Brian, for, named for Brian Jones, the state archeologist who suspected there was something special down deep and was able to see much of it before his untimely death in, 2000, in July of 2019. Our first event was what I called Archaeology 101. It was the basics. Last month, we learned about the geology of the land. Can you name the seven rifts? And how and why the Farmington River was formed. Tonight, we are pleased to have with us someone who has spent his entire career digging in and around this Farmington Valley, finding sites and artifacts, not only on public, but also on private lands. He was a Yukon grad student in 1974 when Connecticut archeology span came of age. Yukon, Central and other universities started field schools, college courses with public lectures and workshops as more and more sites were found. In 1979, Ken founded the CCSU Farmington River Archeology span Project, a long-term multi-year regional archeological site survey. Many of you may have taken his fascinating canoe trip on the river as he explains the archeology span and the people who once lived and worked here. So he was the perfect speaker for our third event in this series. He's now Professor Emeritus of Archaeology, but is still doing these kind of events and still doing some digs now and then. After tonight's presentation, please register for the remaining two events running this September and October. We're planning events for next year as well. We don't know if there'll be webinars or in person. That remains to be seen. Um, both of the September and October events will continue with the educational path toward the understanding of this time in our world's history. So now I'm going to turn this over to Ken, who will certainly share with you much more. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I hope everybody appreciates the dramatic lighting I've got here, the, the cool shadows. And that's all pre-planned, I assure you. Um, the, I've done a bunch of Zooms, and every time I've done it, I've had problems. Uh, so hopefully that's not going to happen tonight. Um, the last time I did a Zoom was a lecture for folks at Penn State University, and uh, our power went out in the middle of the lecture. Oh. So that was fun. I was able to actually get back on on my cell phone, but then the battery died, and I went to plug it in, but of course the power was out. So luckily that all happened towards the end of the, of the, the Zoom. So we're going to do our best right here. Before I start sharing my screen, talking about stuff, there are a couple of things I would like to do first. Um, indulge me here. Acknowledgements. The first is a land acknowledgement. It is the land that I'm talking about, the land where I live. I live in Winchester. You folks, if you're living in the Farmington Valley, it's important to acknowledge the fact that we are certainly not the first human beings to inhabit the Farmington Valley, that the valley has been occupied now, as we now know for sure from the Brian Jones site, for 12,000 years. And the sites, the places we all live, the sites that I excavate were the homelands of a number of Native American groups, the Tungsis, the Masako, the Scaticoke, but there also were Mohegans up here and, uh, and Mohawks came down and a, a bunch of other named groups who lived in, traveled through the Farmington Valley. And we should acknowledge the fact that we are living on the lands that were theirs. The second is a personal acknowledgement. And I wanna talk for one second about the people who inspired me, who are instrumental in the work that I've done. 
um, people who have passed away. Doug Jordan was my mentor at the University of Connecticut. He was a state archaeologist for years and years and years before Brian Jones, before Nick Bellantoni even. Uh, and Doug really got me started in archaeology as a grad student at the University of Connecticut. Fred Warner was the archaeologist at Central Connecticut State University, then college, who actually hired me to teach at Central. And I was always proud of that because there were a lot of applicants. And I always thought I was the, the, the person who got the job because I was the smartest of the applicants. Later on, uh, Fred told me it was because I got the job because I could drive a stick shift. And the survey vehicle was a manual transmission vehicle. And he needed somebody who could drive a stick. Um, that was humbling a little bit. But uh, I, I have to acknowledge Fred for, for giving me the opportunity to do the work that, that we've, I, I've accomplished and that I'm going to talk a little bit about here today. I also want to acknowledge um, Walter Landgraf. Walter, if, you guys, if anybody listening to this lives up in the Northwestern Hills, you know that Walter was a teacher for years at the high school, um, a, a force of nature. Um, although I think as a science teacher, he was absolutely knew more about the history of especially Northwestern Connecticut than anybody else. Uh, shared archaeological sites with me. In fact, one of the sites I'll talk about was shared by Walter and Andrea Rand, another uh, 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 a woman who is uh, still around up in Vermont, who was also very active in archaeology in Connecticut. And so I want to acknowledge Walter's influence on me. He was a mentor and a, and a, and a, a teacher and a colleague and also a student of mine because he was not an archaeologist. He took archaeology courses with me. Um, and also to acknowledge Brian Jones. Brian was a good friend and a colleague and just an absolutely wonderful scholar and, and uh, just a great guy. And yeah, you know, the cliche that he died too soon, well, it really does apply to Brian. And, uh, and Brian's work also as the state archeologist really was instrumental in the kinds of stuff that I was able to accomplish uh, at some of the sites that I'll talk about today. All right, enough of that. Now let's talk about the wonderful Farmington Valley. I am now pushing my share screen button Go to this, say share. All right, we can see it, it's loading. And you're in good? business, you're in business. Fantastic. All right, so the, the title of this thing is what, uh, what you see in the, in the brochure, Connecticut Before History, The Deep Story of Human Settlement of the Farmington Valley. Now, I'm gonna start kind of at the beginning. I'm not sure that everybody uh, listening to this is familiar with the Farmington Valley or lives in the Farmington Valley. Some of this stuff will be new to you. If, even if you do live here, some of it will be old hat, but we'll go through it really quickly anyway. Um, all right, there is a Google Earth photograph of at least a part of the Farmington Valley. You recognize the, uh, the Farmington River starting way up there in southwestern Massachusetts, flowing south, southeast into Farmington, takes this wicked 90 degree turn uh, to flow north along the ridge line. that's Talcott Mountain on the east, and then it flows through the, the, the uh, uh, crack in the ridge line and the Farmington River today flows into the Connecticut River. Um, perhaps in the previous uh, one of the previous uh, zooms, you've heard about, well, that's a, that's glacial. There was a glacial dam there and that rerouted the river. The thing is that when, by the time people got into the Farmington Valley, that configuration was more or less set as the glacier was melting off. Because uh, this is this is up, it, it, as a, a, somebody who's lived in Farmington and I've lived in Simsbury, and now I live up in the Northwestern Hills, I've lived in Riverton, I've lived in, in Winstead, Winchester, it's a little disconcerting for me to go up into Beckett, Massachusetts and see a sign that says Farmington River. But yep, that's our Farmington River. Here uh, up in Massachusetts, it's a little boulder strewn stream. There's even a lovely uh, 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 covered bridge that goes over the Farmington River there. This river obviously gets larger. Um, there was a time back 20,000 years ago when the Farmington River was the fourth major st drainage stream uh, that flew through Connecticut, the, the Thames, the Housatonic, the Connecticut, and the Farmington Pequabuc. Uh, now, of course, it's a tributary of uh, the Connecticut River, but it is absolutely loaded with archaeological history. Uh, here we are. This is, uh, uh, this is my photograph taken by, uh, I was a commercial jetliner flying into Bradley, and we flew over the High Blind Tower. Now that's what the hot tower looks like. We are on Nod Road here in uh, somewhere. It's I think this is actually in Simsbury and you're looking at Talcott Mountain. 
And Talcott Mountain is the eastern boundary of the Farmington Valley. And what's really interesting to me as an archaeologist, but also as an anthropologist, is that that maybe we're looking at 950 feet, it's not quite a thousand feet high, but nevertheless, historically and in antiquity, that ridgeline served as a boundary between two separate river valleys, and in essence, two separate homelands. So that we do see differences in the raw materials used, the stone the, uh, used for making stone tools is actually different on this side of the valley than it is on the other side of the valley. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Now, having grown up on Long Island where there are no mountains, and having lived in Connecticut where our tallest mountains, what, barely 2,300 feet high, it's really interesting to me when students from out of state come to take my archaeology field school and I bring them into the Farmington Valley to give them a kind of a lay of the land, a bird's eye view. And here on Nod Road, I point to Talcott Mountain. And in one instance in particular, I had a young woman whose name was Janine, who was from Northern California, pretty mountainous region. And she was a student taking cl class with a bunch of other students, a lot of Connecticut kids, but kids from New York, kids from, from uh, Boston, kids from Pennsylvania, and this one student from, from California. And I pointed to Talcott Mountain and I said, well, there's Talcott Mountain, that's the Eastern margin of the valley. And Janine, not ironically, not trying to be funny, looked at that Talcott Mountain and said, where? And I pointed, it's, it, it's right there, Janine, it's that mountain right in front of you. And Janine said, on the other side of that hill? I said, well, no, no, Janine, this is Connecticut. It's almost a thousand feet. That qualifies as a mountain here in Connecticut. And Connecticut, Janine just kind of shrugged her shoulders and laughed. And when she went back to California, she sent me a postcard. And this is a photograph of, of uh, Mount Whitney, which is about 14,000 feet. It's got a glacier on it all year round. It's a gigantic mountain. And on the back of the postcard, and I've kept it all these years, she, all she wrote was, Dear Ken, this is a mountain. Ha ha, take it easy, Janine. Well, you know, for Connecticut, by Connecticut standards, we do, you know, Talcott Mountain is a mountain. And it really is significant. It really was a significant uh, demarcation of two separate homelands or regions uh, in, in, uh, for Native Americans. We'll see that in a little bit. So here we are back at Talcott Mount in the High Blind Tower. And I, this is geology and I'm only gonna deal with this very, very quickly. Um, the pink coloration are the basalts. That's the volcanic rock. This stuff was all laid down long before people came into the valley. The blue material is sandstone. And if you're looking at a cross section at that high point where it says Ho Pond, Ho Pond is on Talcott Mountain or King Phillips Mountain, whatever, you know, somewhere along that ridgeline. And those, that pink rock where it's exposed, you can actually see it as you hike up Talcott Mountain. The basalt is a hard rock, it's a volcanic rock, it's an igneous rock. And Although it's very difficult to make stone tools from, it is one of the better raw materials we have locally. And the, the Talcott basalts and especially the Holyoke basalt is very dense, very homogeneous material. And you can, and I'll show you some photographs of stone tools made from that material. In fact, when I talk about Alsop Meadow, the Alsop Meadow site right here in Avon, um, we found chunks of that basalt just eroding right out of that mountain, had been carried down that mountain 5,000 years ago, deposited in a place along the Farmington River, and that material was then used to make stone tools. We have, I'll show you photographs of some of those tools. Now on the ground, this is an aerial photograph of that intersection where uh, 84 spits you, you out into route four. Now this is an older photograph. They've obviously they've reconfigured this all to ease the traffic. Although I've been through there and I don't know if that's worked in easing the traffic, but it's a really nice exposure where you can see the geology, how the geology of the Farmington Valley um, certainly affected the native people and when they moved here and it affects people today. So this is a, a, a look at the basalt the very dark, dense volcanic rock as it's eroding out of that road cut. You can see where it's been, been drilled through. 
This is one of my favorite photographs of that. When you look at the red material at the very bottom of the screen, that's sandstone. If you look at the dark material with little red splotches, that's basalt, that's the volcanic rock. That was lava that flowed out of a crack that marks where Talcott Mountain is now located and flowed over that sandstone. And this is just a, a, a little uh, schematic of, that's 300 million years old. That's the stuff you find dinosaur footprints in. The basalt is 180 million years old. And that unconformity, that's where the two meet in sharp contrast. The reason I show you this at all, I'm not a geologist and I, I don't claim to be an expert, but what we find in the valley is where the basalt overrode the sandstone, it technically metamorphosed it. In other words, it was kind of sort of like making it made glass. Um, not purely glass, but a, a material that's glass-like. And that material is called hornfells. So the, in other words, the sandstone was baked when the basalt overrode it and it metamorphosed and it changed it. And it changed it into something, you don't wanna make sto stone tools out of, out of sandstone. It's brittle material, it's, it can't take, keep a sharp edge. But when you bake it to a very high temperature, it changes the characteristics of that rock into another rock called Hornfels. And Hornfels is very much like flint. Flint is a, a crypto crystalline material, means, means it's got the, the little crystals in it are so small, you almost can't, you can't see them uh, with the naked eye. And rock that's like that is very good at, at taking a sharp edge and much easier to flake than is either pure basalt or sandstone. So the native people knew where this stuff was because it's not everywhere. And we find that virtually every site in the Farmington Valley and in very few sites in the Connecticut Valley, we find artifacts made of hornfells, made of this usually very dark, um, sort of kind of glass-like material. And I'll show you some pictures of artifacts uh, made from hornfells. This, now we're back up on the top of Talcott Mountain. And if you've, if you've hiked to the tower and you take the main trail, you'll pass by this exposure, this beautiful exposure of chunks of prismatic basalt kind of eroding out of the side of the mountain. We find those chunks that fall out naturally, we find pieces of that basalt miles away and a thousand feet lower in elevation at archeological sites dating to as much as 5,000 years ago in the valley. So people knew about this exposure and others along the ridgeline climbed up there, filled their backpacks, brought it back down and then made these uh, made tools out of this naturally sharp edged material. All that you're looking at there, that's all natural. That's natural erosion. That's not made by anybody. But as somebody who does lithic replication, I can make stone tools. I can pick up any one of a number of those chunks that have eroded out naturally and then using another stone to, to beat it, I can make a spear point or an arrow point or a knife. Uh, remember these folks, pr the primary raw material for these folks is rock, is stone. And their ability to craft these into absolutely spectacular tools is, is truly awe-inspiring, especially for somebody who, who makes stone tools as, a, as, as a, an, an, an avocation. Anyway, again, recognize this. Here's a, a photograph of the Farm Valley from the top, from looking down from, from um, Avon Mountain. And all of that, those fields are along the Farmington River. And those were areas where, um, because of the presence of the river, the freshwater sources of streams feeding into the river, the rich soil uh, for, for agriculturalists, and just the very richness of that soil for plant material, for trees, for seed plants, for animals, of course, uh, this was a tremendously attractive area for human people, a, a constellation of variables that would attract human settlement. And the archeological record shows that very clearly. Again, I just love these photographs from the top of Talcott Mountain. There's the ridge line looking north to Mount Holyoke. Here I'm looking, and you can see Mount Holyoke in the, in the distance. So everything on, if I go back, everything on the left of that slide is the Farmington Valley. And looking south down into Meriden, everything on the right of the slide is the Farmington Valley. Um, as, as Terry noted, I, I guess the Farmington River Watershed Association, before COVID, we would do a canoe trip every year, 
they you know, people would rent canoes and we float down the, the Farmington and I would point out all the places where we have found archaeological sites. But you know, you take a that view of the Farmington River, it clearly, very clearly, that's an attractive area. There's gonna be fish in the river, there's gonna be freshwater um, shellfish in the river. The river is an easy way of traveling. Um, it, you, you just follow the river downstream and where, uh, where in the past there were no dams uh, blocking your way. Uh, there are a few rapids, but it's not terribly bad once you get past um, the, the gorge. Uh, it's, a, it's an easy route of transportation. And then along the margins of that river, the soil is very rich. Before there was agriculture in this area, say 11 or 1200 AD, um, these areas are extremely rich with natural resources. And then once agriculture moves in, once people start planting corn uh, and perhaps beans and squash, uh, that's that natural, the river flooding is a natural system of, of fertilizing that the, the, uh, the soil. Here's other views of the Farmington River. This is Satan's Kingdom. And the little streams that feed into the river are all incredibly valuable areas and rich areas and places where we find archaeological sites. Uh, fresh water tumbling down into the river, uh, all kinds of resources along the banks of those rivers. And when the river then, then flows into the Farmington, you've got all kinds of, again, resources that would attract people whose, whose existence and subsistence relied entirely on what nature provided. So you've got firewood and wood for constructing uh, houses, wigwams, uh, wood for making spears, stone uh, tumbling down those streams from the from uh, Talcott Mountain, uh, horn fells found in those streams from the sandstone that's metamorphosed. And with the Farmington River, you also have access through that river to places to the north and even to the west. And so the flint from uh, New York State from the Hudson Valley could travel down those rivers and flow into the hands of the people who knew how to make stone tools. And then, of course, along some of these streams, there are clay resources. And I'll show you some photos of some clay artifacts as well. So these little streams, absolutely vital. In this case, you see actually two things at the same time. You're seeing a stream that along which there are uh, pre-contact sites, Native American sites along that stream, but you also see on either side, that is an, a breached mill dam. And so historically, a mill was built there to take advantage of the water power provided by that stream. So that's another cool thing as an archaeologist is being able to see that there's a, I think it's a Greek word, palimpsest, which is if you write something on a chalkboard and then write over that and write over it and write over it. So there are these strata, these levels of what you've written. Well, the soil is kind of like that. And so we have layer after layer after layer of occupation of the Farmington Valley from 12,000 years ago, then 10,000 and 8,000 and seven and six and so on, right up until European contact. And of course, right up until the, the present day. So it's, it's, it's like a book with many, many pages. And it's the job of the archeologist to try to cipher, decipher those, the stories told in each of those layers. So, and beautiful streams, rock shelters. All right, now here's my embarrassing story. When I uh, began this whole project here in the Farmington Valley, I sent out letters of uh, survey letters to people who live along the river. And you can see here, it's Indian artifacts are commonly found by landowners, planting gardens and so on and so forth. And you see the question number one is have have you ever found or are you aware of any Indian artifacts along the Farmington River? And then I specify pottery, arrowheads, spear points, axes, tomahawks, or other stone tools. I do this because folks who live in the valley know a lot about what's in the soil beneath their feet, especially if they're farmers. But if they put in a swimming pool, if they put in a new driveway, if they dig a garden, you turn soil over and there's a possibility you're going to encounter artifacts. Some the artifacts I'm going to show you are exactly that, are artifacts that people found while doing their, their usual stuff, living out their lives in the Farmington Valley. Now, um, the first year I sent the questionnaire out, I didn't add the qualifiers. I didn't, didn't, I didn't specify. I simply asked, have you ever found or are you aware of any Indian, artif Indian artifacts along the Farmington River? And one landowner, a large landowner in Avon, did not answer didn't send back the survey. I mean, you know, I'd given everybody a self-addressed stamped envelope uh, to, to send it back to me at Central. Um, and so I called them up 
uh, because I figured, well, you know, people are busy. Uh, maybe he didn't get the letter. I was curious because he had owned a lot of property along the river. And he was extremely nice, extremely friendly, very helpful. And when I asked him about had he received the questionnaire, he said, oh, yeah, sure, I did. Uh, and I said, oh, uh, so you know, did, are you, would you fill it out for me? It would be great if you could. And he goes, well, I didn't fill it out because we've never found any artifacts here in Avon. And I said, oh, oh, OK, uh, that's that's fair. Um, and then I said, you know, your neighbors to the north, your neighbors to the south, they found some artifacts. And he was kind of incredulous. Really? He said, no, nah, we haven't been plowing here for years. We never found any artifacts. And I said, okay, thank you very much. I appreciated it. I appreciated the, his time. And we were at that kind of awkward place in the phone conversation where he's about to hang up. I'm about to hang up. But before he hangs up, I hear him say, kind of to nobody in particular, yeah, we never found any artifacts. Hundreds of arrowheads, though. I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, yeah, we got hundreds of arrowheads, but we never found any artifacts. And I thought, oh, my God, that's my bad. I assume every when I say the word artifact, that it's not a technical term, that everybody knows what I'm talking about. So I explained to him, I said, oh, I am so sorry, sir. That's my fault. When I say artifacts, arrowheads are artifacts. And he said, well, why didn't you say so? I thought artifacts were things like pyramids and mummies. And no, I, I, you know, surely had he found any pyramids or mummies in the Farmington Valley in Avon, I would have had a, 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 a I would have made a beeline to National Geographic for a grant. But uh, that was on me. Uh, the next year, I, I clarified what I meant um, by artifact, as you can see there. And what's really been nice is the people of the Farmington Valley, Avon, Simsbury, New Hartford, Canton, uh, Farmington, have been incredibly responsive. That is when the, in most of my colleagues, when they send out a survey, if they get like a 10% response rate, they're really happy. I got a 50% response rate. 50% of the people I sent questionnaires out to responded and talk, many of them didn't had never found anything, but all were interested in it. And I think that's a good a reflection of the fact that the people who live in the long in the Farmington Valley today are by and large very interested in the history of the place that, where they now live and want to know about, about the folks who, who lived here originally, who lived here in the past. And so lots of folks have invited me into their homes, have uh, cooked my field crew brownies and given us lemonade and showed us the amazing artifacts that they have found just plowing their land, digging a rose garden, putting in a swimming pool. And these are the kinds of things that people show me in their collections. I'm not gonna specify exactly where any of these things came from, but I will tell you, this is from a private residence, a garden. This all came out of a garden uh, very close to uh, the high school, Avon High School. And these, so these are things that were left for years in the ground, so the, covered up by deposition and then dug up by somebody just planting, planting their tomatoes, planting their roses, and this is what they found. And even in this small sample, I can tell you there are artifacts that date to 4,000 years ago and artifacts that date to maybe 500 years ago. I can tell you there are artifacts in here that are made of quartz, which is an abundant local material, that large black spear point and kind of the center bottom is, is horn fells, as are the two other dark ones on the bottom right. Uh, the, the triangular one is probably flint. So you got raw materials from all over, but primarily from the Farmington Valley uh, and representing uh, at least 3,500 years of, of occupation. Here's another example. This is in Granby. And these are all triangular and probably these are actually arrowheads. You look at the centimeter scale to the left. These are all pretty small. The ones you saw before were probably spear points. So these are all things that folks not looking for artifacts, not looking for arrowheads have actually encountered. This is an amazing site in Granby. And those are all heavy woodworking tools. So there are axes and adzes and pestles. Um, this is again up in Granby, a gentleman who when he was a kid, uh, 
used to, I guess, I guess his, his, his grandparents owned a potato farm. And when he would go out there in the summer and, and play in the potato fields, these are the kinds of things he found. And this is more of the same. The, uh, the styles of spear points very often reflect the time period. So for most of you folks, if you were to look at pictures of cars, of old cars, you might not be able to give an exact year, but you'd say, oh, that's the Model T, that's the 1920s. Or, oh, those, that, those, that style of car, that's like the 1950s. Uh, it's the same thing with spear points. So I can tell you that A, the one on the top left, that with that strange, that's called a bifurcate base, you're looking at something that's probably eight or 9,000 years old. After the period that the Brian Jones site was occupied, people still lived in Connecticut and their spear point uh, styles changed. And that one in the upper left is, is a reflection of that. And then we have a, a bunch of other spear points, different time periods. Those black shiny ones are all flint. So that, that's material that moved in from New York State. That's again, the same site. This is all up in Granby. Now, when I bring a field crew out into the field, one of the things, one of the, the quick and dirty ways of, of assessing the archeological potential of a field is by getting permission from the farmer to walk it once it's been plowed. This is in Farmington, it's behind the sewage treatment plant. And the reason we came here is that historically, this is the location of the Tungsis Indian village as noted in documents that date to the 17th century. So the Tungsis were living here as white settlers were moving into the other side of the river, where now uh, the, that main drag where Miss Porter School is and a bunch of beautiful old homes, the old, uh, old cemetery is there. Uh, as, as Europeans are moving into that section of the Farmington Valley, the Tungsis are living here, and that's in the 17th century. Um, and so, of course, we we're walking the plowed fields looking for any evidence of that 17th century site, and just walking the field, we find these little flakes, these little chips. Some of those are flint. Uh, and when you, when you make stone tools, there's a particular way in which stone tools are made. And the detritus, the, the, technically it's called debitage, the waste flakes, the things that come off of a tool as you're making it. Think of a sculptor, sculpt, think of Michelangelo sculpting uh, uh, David and all those pieces of marble that go flying off and then just get reused to something else or get discarded. It's more or less the same thing when you're making stone tools. And so those flakes are all absolutely diagnostic of the stone tool making process. And those are things we picked up as we walk those fields. Um, and we dig test pits. What's one of the ways we find archeological sites is by digging holes in the ground. This is in West Simsbury, um, a field and we are laying in test pits every 10 meters. This is another field also in West Simsbury. Uh, at this point, yep, we're using shovels because we are merely doing soundings. We are digging holes, uh, screening all that soil. Once we find something, the shovels get put away and we use trowels. And this is an example of that uh, in the foreground where people now are screening what's one eighth inch mesh cloth, hardware cloth and they're screening the soil looking for any, any little bits of evidence. Um, the kind of dopey analogy that I use is that you 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 know the uh, you you can reconstruct a crime by looking at a crime scene. Um, we reconstruct a life by looking at an archaeological site. So the kinds of evidence that a forensic scientist might look for, uh, bullet uh, shell casings, or fingerprints on the windowsill, or blood spatters or a pride open window. Those bits of evidence that from at the scene of a crime help reconstruct the crime, which happened in the past. It could be yesterday, it could be a week ago, it still is the past. We've got a, a, a scene of a life that was lived maybe 500 years ago, maybe in the case of the Brian Jones site, 12,000 years ago. But just the way people leave behind evidence at a crime scene, human beings leave behind evidence of of their lives, of the food they cooked, of the animals they butchered, of the tools they made, of the things they traded for. Uh, and we as archeologists are doing that same kind of work in trying to extract, to coax information or evidence out of the ground very, very carefully. 
And here's an, this again, this is in West Simsbury. One of my students is screening. And in the screen, you can see all those bits of stone. And then on his yellow clipboard, those beautiful flakes, all of that material is Hornfels. And I can't even tell you exactly where that Hornfels came from originally, but I know it's in the stream that borders this site. So it came from somewhere else. It, it was tumbled down this stream. The native people looked through the stream, found these chunks of Hornfels and made them into tools. That's a core. So that's a piece from which a flake is removed and then made into a stone tool. I'll show you um, uh, some slides of finished stone tools in just a little bit. This is a map from a few years ago. Every one of those red diamonds represents an archeological site in our records, Simsbury, Avon, Farmington, Canton, uh, East Granby, and all the way straight through um, into uh, Windsor. And this is only a small fraction of what actually is in the area. So now let's look at a couple of other things. This is a general time, uh, uh, time sequence. This is, understand that this is more or less arbitrary. Archaeologists divide up time into these segments and the segments reflect changes in climate. They reflect changes in subsistence and what people are eating. And I have a few examples of sites from these different time periods. Um, this is the thing that probably uh, alerted uh, Brian to the fact that there were paleo sites. There were 10,000, 11,000, 12,000 year old sites in the Farming Valley was this uh, spear point found where you know, Blue Fox Run now is just near Belcampo, where years ago when they were doing landscaping there, Red Wilson, who was a very well-known amateur archeologist was going through the dirt and he found these spear points. And based on the style, we're pretty sure we're looking at 10,000 years ago. Alsop Meadow is one of my favorite sites, one of the first sites I, I dug in the Farmington Valley and it's 5,000 years old. Um, it is uh, just a, an amazing site. You dig through a couple of feet of topsoil laid down by the Farmington River and there's not a single stone in there. It's beautiful, clean alluvial soil. And then you get to one specific level and there are literally 16,000 bits of stone, many of them complete artifacts on this one very narrow band of soil representing a 5,000 year old village. Um, that, that kind of strange stain is actually what's left of a fireplace. And that's where we recover charcoal. Charcoal is what enables us to date an archeological site. That's how the Brian Jones site was dated to cl close to 12,000 years ago. This dates actually to 4,950 years plus or minus about a hundred years. That is a beautiful basalt spear point. Having attempted to make spear points out of basalt, I bow down to the person who made this 5,000 years ago. This was a real, this was an artist who was able to do that. It's a little bit broken on the bottom there where it would half done to a wooden shaft, but that's an amazing example. This is also basalt and it's a drill. Remember, without metal, a lot of what you're gonna rely on, well, wood is important, bone is important, but basically stone is your hardest and most durable material and the material that will be produced the sharpest durable edge. So this is actually a drill. And when we look at the, the tip to the right under a microscope, you can actually see the scratch marks perpendicular to the bit indicating that that was used to drill holes. Drill holes in other stone, drill holes in wood uh, or bone. Uh, in order to make a pendant, or to make a, a musical instrument, or to make some other tool. Uh, and that is, I will absolutely guarantee you, that is an expert's uh, uh, flint work. We call it flint work even if it's not flint. Um, the Avon Old Farms Brook site, which is another site in Avon, located along the Farmington River. This site is 4,200 years old. Uh, that's one of my, my good friends, Barbara Calagero, student for years. Uh, what, she, what you're looking at there is an earth oven. Those stones, there's no other stones anywhere in the soil. Those stones were all piled up together in one place. 
uh, having been put in a fire, so the stones were, were burned somewhere else, hot stones picked up with tongs, placed here and the, at the bottom of a pit, and then, say, an acorn dough put over that to, to bake it. And that's what it looks like when it's excavated. Archaeology is all about paying attention. So we're scraping down at the Avon Old Farms Brook, where the a Old Farms um, Brook feeds into the Farmington. And we notice this soil is kind of mottled, it's black. Very often that's a result of organic deposit. Organic deposit can be natural or it can be uh, anthrop anthropogenic. It can be produced by people. And sure enough, as we dug down, we saw this bed of rocks. There are no rocks anywhere else. It's just in this flat area. Yeah, that's, that's a good picture of it from up above. A square-ish platform of rocks all down at one level. You'll notice there are no rocks anywhere else. All of those rocks had been in a fire and mixed in that those rocks is charcoal and animal bone. That's called a roasting platform. So 4,200 years ago, somebody killed, butchered, cooked, and ate an animal, and it likely was a deer based on the bones that we found. You see that white arrow, it's pointing to an, another artifact found at the same level as the roasting platform, and there it is. So if you're looking for the, uh, the smoking gun, that's the smoking gun. And the tip was broken off, which is typically what happens when these spear points enter into the animal of a body and hit a bone, the tip breaks off. So I'm speculating a little that at least one of the animals that was cooked on that roasting platform 4,200 years ago was uh, killed with that spear point. Uh, we're, time, I, I can go on forever, but I'm not going to, I promise. Um, this is the Walter Landgraf soapstone quarry. I mentioned Walter and the wonderful contribution he made, uh, inspirational contribution he made to my work. And this is a 2,800 year old site that Walter found with Andrea Rand. Andrea Rand um, was an, uh, an archeologist. She lived in Connecticut for years and years and years, but she and her husband moved up, I think to Vermont, but she uh, played a major role in archeology span here in the Northwestern Hills. And she and Walter were out there one day and uh, they encountered the soapstone quarry. And Andrea very uh, generously shared the, the location with me and the field school uh, of our archeology field school at Central Connecticut State University. We were back there in 2013, 15, and 17. Um, and what you're looking at there, that, that's a meter stick, so that's three feet. So altogether, we're looking at something over what, eight or nine feet. And that is a piece of soapstone, soapstone rustiotite, a soft rock that native people in Southern New England and elsewhere carved into bowls primarily before pottery moved into the area. Ceramics shows up in Connecticut around 3,000 years ago from the West, from New York, or from the South. And before that, if you wanted a good, dense, hard material to make a waterproof and fireproof bowl, soapstone was the way to go. So you're looking at there three, on the top where those arrows are pointing to three unfinished bowl forms, and on the far right, Two, one, especially large, beautifully carved, unharvested bowl. So these are bowls that were left in place. They were not removed in antiquity. And here's an artist's conception of what uh, carving one of those, those bowl forms out must have looked like. These are the tools we found at the site used for extracting soapstone. And there's the, the, the quarry itself. What's really cool about this site is that it, I think it reflects a concept in economics called disruptive innovation. So that these folks are in the middle. Soapstone is not found everywhere. So if you live where there's soapstone, you might be able to monopolize that raw material for trade. And because people can't find it anywhere else. Well, if you've got this material that everybody wants, but one day somebody walks into your village and says, you know, we don't need your soapstone anymore. We've got these clay bowls and we know how to make them. And clay is everywhere. That innovation of ceramics disrupts trade. It disrupts the normal course of events and it disrupts technology and everything changes. And I would not be surprised if this very quarry was abandoned specifically because, you know what? 
Nobody needed this raw material anymore because you could make clay pots and clay, although it's not clay ceramics, obviously not as durable, but man, it breaks, you make another one and, and clay is found everywhere. So I think that this is an example of disruptive innovation and just beautiful imagery of, uh, of the soapstone quarry. Those are two unharvested bowls and all that, that's not natural. That's somebody carving it around and carving it around and ultimately they'll carve under it to remove it. These are some of the artifacts used. And we even found the larger part of one of the bowls, the finished soapstone bowls. That's what it looks like back in the lab. So that's a lug on the right. You're missing a little more than half of it probably. So it is not necessarily pretty, this is the Fisher Meadow site where we have ceramics. Again, not pretty, but it gets the job done. You'll see that there's a, like a corrugation on those, those that pot shirt on the top. That's a design that was intentionally added to the wet clay. It also strengthened the coils. This None of this is wheel made. This is all coil made pottery. And that is part of a piece of slate that was drilled through. Um, we call it a gorget. It may have been used as, a, as an amulet, as a piece of jewelry. And the holes were drilled with stone drills. That's another piece of that gorget. That's about 1,500 years old, 2,500 years old, excuse me. The Glacier Blade Cache, which is in Granby, uh, this is 3,000 years old. Amazing, amazing place. Uh, I misspoke. It's 1,500 years old. I'm sorry. 15 or 1,600 years old. And this is 30 of these gigantic stone blades. These are beautiful um, drawings of those blades, of all 30 of them. And this probably was not, these are not utilitarian. The material is too soft. No evidence of it ever being used. Our best guess is that this is part of a ceremony, that these were being made specifically to bury in the ground. That's speculation for sure, but I'm very certain that these were not used, these were not produced for any particular practical use. And um, site I'll end with is the Barkhamstead Lighthouse, which is in Northwestern Connecticut. Archeology span in Connecticut doesn't end when Europeans got here or Afri people of African descent got here. It continues because native people interacted with people of African descent, people of European descent, and in some cases created entire communities that were mixed. And that there's the location of the lighthouse in the People's State Forest. Um, land was donated by the Connecticut Daughters of the American Revolution in 1929. And it says there, near the spot was the site of an Indian village. People considered it an Indian village, even though it was mixed. Uh, Lewis Mills, the high school in Burlington is named after Lewis Mills. Um, he wrote this 150 page long poem about the lighthouse site uh, initiated by, this is a, a, a quarry at the site. This was initiated by a white woman who married a Narragansett Indian man. They had a bunch of kids, other native people, Tonksis and Mohegan moved into the village, married their children, married into the community, a uh, person of African descent married into the community and their descendants uh, flowed across the landscape we have at the site, we have charcoal kilns. There are four of them there. We have thousands of artifacts. This is a, a, a schematic of what the, the site itself looked like. Ceramics found inside. This is all 18th and 19th century pottery, ceramics that, that were traded into the village. Typical 19th century site. But what's not typical is that the descendants of the people who lived at the lighthouse are still around and their story is being told. The woman on the far left is Connie Dubois, who is a ninth generation descendant of the folks at the lighthouse. And Connie has been instrumental in letting everybody, all the descendants, so she has a website, she has a Facebook page of people and has been doing the genealogy to find all the people across the country. Connie lives in Louisiana uh, and her sister lives in California. There are people all over the country who can trace their, their ancestry back to the Narragansett Indian man, James Chagum, the, the European American woman, uh, Molly Barber, who married, grew up, uh, uh, married, uh, had their kids grow up in what is now Bar Campstead, and those kids married into other families that were moving into Northwestern Connecticut. There's Connie, 
It's a touching image of Connie visiting. This is her father was the one who told her the story of their ancestry and said, someday, Connie, I want you to find out more about this. Connie contacted me. We are now friends and colleagues. And here's Connie visiting the cemetery of the Lighthouse people. And uh, for those interested, there is a booklet. You can find this online for free for nothing, a PDF of this booklet we wrote about that site. And here's Connie uh, uh, revealing the signage. If you uh, drive on East River Road in Bark Hampstead, you can see the sign by the side of the road and a trail leads you up to the other, uh, the other sites. There are a bunch of other signs. And in 2015, there was a family reunion. So these folks came from all over the country. They're all different colors, all different looks, but these folks all can trace back to uh, James Changham and Molly Barber. And uh, the, when, when Lewis Mills wrote about the generation speeding onward of the Lighthouse tribe, these are the people he was talking about, even though he was writing in the 1950s. They are still here, they're still around and proud of their ancestry. I was uh, uh, lucky enough to be able to give these folks a tour of their site. And I don't know if you can see me, that's, I'm that white haired guy right in the middle of the parade. It's one of my proudest moments when Connie, who had arranged all this, you see Connie's right behind me. Uh, I was along that parade route and I wanted to take some pictures and Connie grabbed me and said, no, Kenny, you're not gonna be walking, you're not gonna be uh, sitting along the parade route. We want you marching with us. And I said, Connie, the, the parade is for family. And Connie looked at me and said, Kenny, your adopted family because of the work you've done here. And just absolutely, I, I, I actually tear up when I tell that story because being most of my, my work is with folks who have long been gone and I don't know their direct ancestors, but in the case of the Lighthouse people, the, all those people in the red shirts, those people are the descendants of James and Molly. And that's part of the story of Connecticut as well. Now, I am gonna get out of here I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm back. So I think we're looking at 7.50, so I've been droning on for an hour. I told, I, 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 told, uh, uh, I told folks at the library that, you know, three hours would, was probably enough time for me, but they, they, they kind of, they, they dialed me back. So there's an hour. I hope I haven't, dr I haven't put too many people to sleep and if, You've got questions. I'd love to try to answer questions in the next, what, 15 minutes or whatever. No, thank you, Ken. So that's the end of our formal presentation. We absolutely will do the questions now because we do have them coming in. And I'm going to start with the one that has Peter, been- Can I, can I just okay. ask him one thing, Ken, I wanted you to tie back to the Brian Jones site because that's what this whole series is about. Remember I asked earlier, can you quickly mention the Woodland site that you found near there? Oh, right. I'm that sorry. Um, the site that I showed, that, that, that Fisher Meadow site, the, the yeah. pottery with the, the cool corrugations, we found that, that was, we're talking about the early 1980s, and that was right up hard fast against the Farmington River. Most of that site had already been destroyed by the river eroding it. So we literally found like a little thin sliver of the site and, the, and then the river had taken the, the rest away. What we didn't know is if we had gone out into the soccer field, though that was in the woods, the soccer fields of Fisher Meadow, which were not that many feet away, if we had gone down there and gone down several feet far deeper than we went for the Fisher Meadow site, which is 2,500 years old, we had no idea that there was a 12,000 year old site there. And that's that's one of the banes of archeology. span There's an old cartoon about paleontologists um, that there's, you can see the cross section of the cartoon is there's a brontosaurus upside down, it's bones. And the paleontologist digs between, he doesn't know he's there, digs between the, the, the neck and the first legs, between the, the two sets, the front and rear legs, between the rear leg and the tail, after the tail, it says, no, there's nothing here. And it really is, it's the luck of the draw. That site probably would not have been discovered had Brian not said, look, Kenny's already found sites here. There are sites along the river there. If they're gonna put in a new bridge, they need to do some testing. And with that, that kind of support behind it, that's what inspired uh, the work and that's what led to the discovery of what may be the most important site in Southern New England. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. and you know, people say, well, Kenny, are you really angry that you didn't find the old site? No, not at all. I, I, we were really happy what we found, what we found. And the fact that as a result of Brian's work, this even older site was found there, 
that's I, I'm perfectly okay with that. That's great. Right, and that means that there could be even more. You could probably. Um, I, I would say that. that could be is an understatement. There right. absolutely are more sites there. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Hey, thank you. I wanted to. Oh yeah, that. absolutely. That's right. We did talk about that ahead of time. Okay, so the first question is one that has come in in more than one form, and it is why were arrowheads discarded, especially if they appear unused or in good condition when you're finding them? Well, what see, here's what here's what I think is happening. The, number one, we sometimes find isolated spear points or, or arrows. And what that means is that somebody was out hunting, they shot, they lost the arrow, it gets covered by soil, it's forgotten about, and by luck, somebody finds it. But when we're looking at village sites, yeah, people are, are stockpiling those. They are caching those. So they're hiding them for, for, for future use, but they're moving around. So you may leave a, a, a whole bunch of spear points or arrows at a site, bury them in a storage pit, and you're constantly making these things. And then you're, you go off in the fall to another location and the people split, split, spread apart. Now the intention is you're gonna come back to that site and you're going to dig up those caches and use those tools while you're there. This way you don't have to carry stuff everywhere. There may be better sources of rock elsewhere. So you're always, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, like plant, it's like digging a hole and putting your seed corn in there and know you're gonna come back next spring to plant it. So you don't have to carry all that stuff around. You leave it in place because you're going to come back there. But eventually people don't come back. Eventually the river covers it up and now it's all lost. Or eventually somebody else comes and takes all that stuff and it's gone. Or eventually you just never get back to that spot for whatever reason. And that material gets covered up by the river flooding or by leaves falling and it gets lost. And it's, it takes an archaeologist digging in the right places to be able to find them. So yeah, in most cases, these were not intentionally discarded. The intention was to come back and use them. And just, we get, we're lucky when, the, you know, some tragedy befalls a group and they don't come back and use and find them and use them. Okay. Um, our next question is, how did indigenous people learn about resources in areas outside of the immediate area they lived in? Oh, they're, they're walking around the two ways. Number one is they're walking around a lot. And so they probably have a really good mental map of where there's good rock, of where there are really good old trees, of where good fishing places are, because they're, they're not staying in one place. They're moving around a lot. And they're moving around a lot to trade. So you, you may have people in the Farming Valley going as far as the Hudson Valley to pick up flint. And so they know what resources are available. They also know who are the nice folks, who are the not nice folks. I mean, like anybody else, they're, they're moving around, they're traveling around. Um, and in some cases, they can't get direct access to material because a group might monopolize it. And in some cases, they just trade for it. So I mean, like anybody else, they're not confined to one little part of the Flemington Valley. They have resources, they have connections, they have social connections to people outside and they're, they're, they're moving around a lot. They're, they're walking around a lot and they probably have a really good mental map of where there are good things, where there are good resources. Okay. Um, tied, Their survival depends on that. That makes sense. Tied to that is just a comment from one of our uh, audience members who said in this month's Scientific American, there's a, there's a big article about the origins of Native Americans. Um, yes, that article is written by a friend of mine, Jennifer Raff, who's a geneticist. She's brilliant. It's a fantastic article. And it does, she, she does a really good job of showing how our thoughts about the first Americans, how those thoughts have evolved. Because the earliest evidence, <clears throat> when I started teaching more than 40 years ago, it was pretty much said, all right, people got here around 12,000 years ago. So the Brian Jones site would be one of the oldest sites in North America. We now know that's not true. We now know that especially up in the Northwest, we've got sites that may date to as much as 25,000 years ago. That that initial movement of people can be 25, 30, or even more, 25,000 or even more years ago. And we have sites in Texas that are 15,000 years old and sites in Washington state that are 15,000 years old. So yeah, that's so if you get a chance to read that article, by all means do. Uh, uh, Dr. Raff is just aces. All right, Terry, we should book her. I'm just saying. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Our, our next hey, question. You can, you can drop my name. All right. Excellent. Excellent. We yeah, love that. That's, that's good because we're making the list for next year. So we'll do that. I got, and I have a Scientific American here. I can look it up. Okay, great. Sure, hey. sure. 
Um, next question, are there indigenous sacred stone landscapes, constructions or arrangements of stones or serpent walls, or is it carns or car cairns, cairns um, in the Farmington Valley? Uh, that's a really good question. And I know that my friend and colleague, Mark Banks, actually is doing a survey of those stone features of stone walls and cairns and other kind of anomalous stone structures. Hey, look, um, if you would ask me this 10 years ago, I'd say, no, probably not. Probably all those stone, um, stone features are colonial, that they're, stone, they're, they're piles of stone to clear, to clear landscapes for agriculture. But, you know, I'm, I am open to other possibilities, and I've, I have been shown in the Farmington Valley um, stone cairns, or I just I shake my head and I go, "There's just this. No, this is not a cleared farmer's field. I don't know who did this. I don't know how old it is, and I am not in it, by any stretch of the imagination going to cut off the possibility that no, these are ancient sacred landscapes built by native people. We, we know they did it elsewhere, so it's certainly." A, 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 a possibility that they did it here as well. Okay. Um, based on the sites and artifacts you've investigated, has anyone tried to extrapolate or estimate a total quantity of sites or peoples that existed throughout the Farmington Valley? It's, that is such a, a difficult question because again, it's a palimpsest, right? We're looking at sites that are not necessarily contemporaneous. You, you want a population size, you want how many people live there at a particular time. Um, and so, I, it's, I, here's what I'll tell you, that at its peak, there were thousands of people here. Now, not tens of thousands, probably, probably, but there were thousands. Um, and then if you go back far enough in time, you know, there were dozens and then there were hundreds, but probably at the peak during this period of a thousand years ago to 2000 years ago, there very well may have been more, certainly more than a thousand people living in, in hamlets scattered throughout the Farmington Valley. Um, they're doing all kinds of sophisticated technologies and travel and trade. And it was a vibrant culture and a lot of people. Okay. And do you think it's possible that the First Nation tribes along this side of the river had con co contact with the Podunk on the other side around the South Windsor area? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely, I don't, I, I don't just think that's possible. I think that's for certain. But it is really interesting that when you look on either side of Talcott Mountain, the stones, the, the stone being used to make artifacts is very different for the within time periods. So, yeah, I remember a few years ago, there was an article in the Hartford Current about Talcott Mountain being this kind of barrier between people who live in the Farmington Valley and the Connecticut Valley. And that, now we're talking the 20th and 21st centuries. And you know how Talcott Mountain, bad snow closes the mountain, closes Route 44. So if in the modern world, we perceive that as a real, as an economic and geographic and social barrier, well, you know that 5,000 years ago, it certainly would have been. It was not that it's, it, it, it's not insurmountable, of course, but that it, it served us as, as a way of at least saying, okay, there's this side and there's this side. There's communication between the two. There's some trade, but they probably perceive themselves as being different, as having different homelands. Okay, that makes sense. Um, this next question is an important one and it's coming it's come in through a couple of forms. What are you supposed to do if you have an interesting find on your property um, near a stream, uh, in a field? Who do you call? Who are you supposed to reach out to? And also related to that, what if you find something on or near the Farmington River? What are you supposed to do? Uh, the, the best thing to do is to photo document what it is. Um, if it's something that's about to fall into the river, uh, I don't have any problem with you picking it up. But the person to contact is the state archaeologist of Connecticut. Um, that's, the, that's your best bet. Um, because again, these, these are rare and precious resources. And once they're, nobody's making 10,000 year old or 5,000 year old sites anymore, obviously. And so once these things are removed from the ground, you have, you've altered them forever. If you do it as an uh, in an archeological context and you record everything, uh, that's one thing. But if you just kind of pick it up, put it in your pocket and walk away with it, that's something else entirely. So yeah, your best bet is, and we, we can, you, we can include, uh, what is it, Sarah Sportman's contact information, the state archaeologist's contact information, and that's your very best bet. It's also, if it's on state land, if you're walking through a state forest, uh, it's also a great idea to, to contact Kathy um, 
Labadia, who is uh, at the State Historic Preservation Office in Hartford. So she is a state official and she's more directly uh, in charge of state property. But both of those, either one of those, either Kathy or Sarah are the perfect people to contact. Okay. Um, and then the last question we have, uh, do you or, or does anyone in your team um, give demonstrations on the making of stone tools? Not only would that be a great addition to this slideshow, people are interested in learning how to do it. Um, I'm pretty good. I actually have a student who is was a, 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 is a grad student. He's working on his PhD, but I think he's back in Connecticut, who is absolutely expert in it. And I can hook you up with, with Matt Sweeten. And he is, he is really, really good. There are a number of people who are fantastic at it, um, but he's the one that, that I know the best. And if, if anybody's interested, Matt, I think would just love to give a, a Zoom demo and to show you some of the stuff that he's done. I feel he like makes stone tools and he's done metallurgy and weaving and pottery. And, and uh, if, you know what, if, if the technology all dies off tomorrow, I want to be standing right behind yeah. Matt because he's going to survive. He's going to survive. Yeah. yeah. And if anybody needs uh, Kathy or Sarah's contact information, um, I have that because I'm in touch with them about um, <laughs> the event and with other uh, Shippo things that they're doing. So we can do that. That's easy. Yep. I can absolutely share that. Well, Ken, thank you very much for sharing your evening with us. Oh, you're welcome. Yes, thank you. This was great. It was a great add on to what we've been talking about. I think this just helps it kind of bring some more focus into it. So that's just great. Oh, listen, thank you, everybody. I hope I answered all your questions. You can always send more questions my way. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. We'll see you hey, the next day or two. Bye. Right. Bye bye.